Hey everybody, how's it going? Thank you for joining us today. I'm so glad that you're with us. Here's to you for joining us live or in replay, I guess. Here's to you. The local time is 12.42 p.m. We have perfect weather outside, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, no wind, flowers are out, ideal spring weather, and yet hopefully we'll all be here today in person in the classroom. So we will begin, of course, at the top of the hour. That's more than 15 minutes from now. I had all sorts of surprises with technology uh, in the last 20 minutes, so I just wanted to get this going to make sure we don't have a problem because Emma's been in here listening to me uh, mutter under my breath about everything that was off was off, but I do believe we are functional. Let's double check and make sure that's the case. How are we doing? Where are you viewing from? And uh, after all of my uh, sweating here in the last few minutes, um, are we functional? Nicole's excited to be here. Well, I'm excited that you're here, uh, Nicole. Uh, our tour from Turku, Finland. Uh, Peter says uh, Dayton, Ohio. Garrett, the Dutch night owl. Judy says it's five by five. That's great to see, Judy. And John, thank you. Loud and clear say you all. Well, that's great. I won't be I won't be thinking about that. Esteban from Portugal. Hi. Bremerton, Washington. Uh, Sonora, Arkansas. Bohemia. There it is again. I always get a little charge when I see that. Greetings from Greece. Speaking of charges, uh, it's wonderful to, to see all these places as usual. Carefree, Arizona. That's Kim. Uh, Therese is from the Netherlands. Tillamook, Oregon. All right. Brussels, Belgium. Uh, UK, Prosser, Seattle, uh, Ottawa, Ontario, Detroit, Michigan, Orla Orland, uh, Pennsylvania, I guess that is, Cologne, Germany, uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, hello Arnie, um, Whatcom, Madison, Arapaho, uh, Oklahoma, uh, wow, okay, nice, Carlsbad, New Mexico, Jew, this is in Massachusetts, Penticton, B.C., Northern Ireland, Boulder Creek, California, Willits, California, Muncie, Indiana, Central Silesia. Okay, man. Well, we're doing Silesia again today. Uh, Marion, Virginia. Aarhus, Denmark. That's cyclical cycler. Nadia from his... Uh, Nadia, you're from Iran. Special shout out to you. Hello. Thank you for joining us. You know, I was on Instagram an hour ago sitting out in the backyard. Obviously not working that hard. And uh, I don't know if you've been on Instagram, but there's all the stories that are up above. I saw some uh, students from yesterday's field trip uh, posting some photos. That was nice. But I saw somebody was live and I clicked on it and it was a Russian geologist, a woman, and she was split screen with another Russian geologist, and they were just talking back and forth on Instagram Live. I don't have the name, uh, but I just sat there for 10 minutes in my backyard just listening to this discussion about geology in Russian. I didn't, I didn't understand a word, but I was, I was so enjoying it, and, you know, it's 30 years ago or 40 years ago, you know, the Russians were our enemy, and it was hard to imagine any, you know, real people in Russia uh, during the Cold War. So here's these these two women, maybe in their 30s, uh, uh, passionately talking about geology. And I was so motivated, I like uh, I like typed in. I said, "Hi, I'm watching from uh, Ellensburg, Washington, USA. I don't understand a word you're saying, but I'm enjoying being here." And they were both like, "Oh, hi, Nick." It was just, you know, I know that you're all here and you're saying where you're from, but that was, uh, uh, that was different. That was actually being, you know, part of a conversation, even though there was a language barrier. Super cool. And uh, of course, we're all kind of getting little jolts here and there from uh, those kinds of experiences with this, with this live business. So just thought I'd share that. How about a few more hellos? We've got... Uh, Allah, Allah.
Alexa, Alexis. Alexis, today might be the day. I might hear your voice today. Don't want to put any pressure on you. But you might be the silent jack this quarter. Emma, too, is uh, uh, happy to chat in the field, but she's already said she's not much for speaking in, in a classroom setting. That's what Bryce is for. Bryce, well, Bryce is used for so many reasons. Yeah. No, I got you. Oh, so if you want to say something, you like elbow Bryce and say, say this. And he's like, uh, uh, yeah, what about the, yeah, what a stooge. <laughs> All right, so we got two people in the room. Uh, I expect a, a bunch more showing up in the next few minutes. Uh, so, hey, uh, I got no thank yous or anything. That's uh, I, I wanted to share that little Russian live thing. Uh, there's a, we were out in the field yesterday overlooking Kashmir, Washington, a beautiful day. Um, met a couple of people, uh, where we parked our vehicles and was, I was kind of rattled. So I was filming a little bit and talking to them as we were hiking up. Guy knew a lot about forestry, but I was rattled. So I didn't have my microphone on. <laughs> so I, I got a bunch of footage without any sound, and then I finally figured that out. Uh, I'll, I'll post that uh, Cashmere Overlook video this weekend. And I'm going out tomorrow with a field geologist named Andrew Sadowski. If you're a fan of the live stream series from my backyard last spring, Andrew Sadowski, I, I forget what we called the episode, but uh, we're gonna go out and, and uh, scout for some uh, rhyolite outcrops of the Tianway Formation. So doing a little homework for this class, basically. Okay, I promise, a little bit more. So if, uh, sorry if you've already chimed in with where you are, but I'm gonna, oh, Patrick's here. Patrick, age seven, or so he says, is here. Hello, Patrick. Uh, Reno, Nevada, Minnesota in the hizzy. Dr. Drew in the house. Linda, Harley Ryder, Reenie. Oscar from San Diego, Kyle Roth. Now we're creeping right along. I can read every freaking. Oh, your Alexa is listening. <laughs> yeah, I saw somebody posted something that the Alexa does get kicked off. Yeah, we won't do much more of that. Hi, Myra. She's from Cornell. From Cornelia. Ivan is from Aberdeen, Scotland. How's it going this evening? Um, uh, already forgot your name. Good Lord. Ivan, yes. Stephen says, it's me. Heidi's in Hood River, Oregon. Kyle's in Hillsborough, Oregon. Oh, we got Oregonians here today. Matthias, hello from Switzerland. What up, homie? Kingston, Washington. Richard from Squim, Washington. Um, oh, that's great. I mean, I'd go chat with the students, but there's nobody here yet. So I guess you're stuck with me. I couldn't find my tracing paper. I was actually really pleased with that. Uh, remember the, did you see last episode? A, thank you, thank you, Emma. Thank you. I had that little flashlight and I had the tracing paper and we were talking about drifting North America over a stationary mantle plume, but I've looked everywhere. I, I don't know where I set that tracing paper. Maybe somebody took it. Um, all right. Starting to get nervous. We're going to have anybody here? Uh, I, don't, I don't know where you are in the series. If you've been watching these sequentially or you pop in here and there, I, I don't know if this makes a whole lot of sense if you just watch one or two of these. Uh, so, of course, the class is working sequentially through some of this material, and it's obvious, I'm sure, that I'm learning a lot, and it's quite rough. Um, yes, last time was particularly kind of awkward, I thought. Um, but, you know, I watch it. So I, I always finish live streaming this, this class, and it's new, and it's awkward and everything, and I, always, I feel like, oh, man, that really went poorly. And then I have to say, I watch it in replay, um, that evening, and uh, I'm like, that was pretty good, not bad. So uh, um, I don't know if you can relate to that, but when you're doing something in real time and it does, you don't really know what's happening or how it's going to work, um, 
in the moment, it feels not great. But um, I have a plan today that's a little different than the, the other plans. Okay, now we're almost five minutes to the hour. We still don't have anybody. Ah, here we go. Yeah, Bryce. Yeah, Ash. Mary's here. Um, say again. Oh, I'm going to go talk to Bryce. Sounds like he went up to a spot that uh, only the uh, Brave went to yesterday out in the field. So thank you for joining us. We will begin our session at uh, 1 o'clock. That's a little bit more than five minutes from now. I'm so glad you're with us. Thank you. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry. I'm going to double check one more time. I don't know what, what was going on earlier, but I got to make sure we're doing okay. Blue light is on. Delay in the comments. Here they come. They come a rolling on in. Bryce is, you got a sample, Bryce? I do. Ooh. There it is. Sid, Rini, Eric, Patrick, Kyle. A lot of five by fives. That's good. Okay. Thank you. All right. So you went up. You and Tim. So was the guy John accurate in saying that that visible section, it was another one of those basically to get to that spot? Yeah, so it was that really, really steep hike up. The first one? Yeah. Okay. Steep. Um, and then you get up and you go up down a little bit and then you go up another little part and there's just the huge quartz vein right there. And then we were going to go to the very top, but we had to turn. Oh, I should show these guys if you got one to show me. Oh, my God. So you didn't have to hunt. It was like everywhere. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Did you find the outcrop? Was it uh, truly a, uh, a vein? Oh, yeah. I said vike, like a vein um, and a dike together. There was tons how, of it. How wider than this? Uh, here, I got pictures. Uh, well, I want to show these guys quick. Can you verbally... Individual pieces, though, or an actual outcrop of the vein? Okay. So when you see the, uh, I'm visiting with Bryce, who hiked up to a place that none of us got to yesterday. Some of us headed back to the vehicles after a couple hours out there, and Bryce and Tim and somebody else. Who, Ryan went up a little higher. And we got a tip from John out there who was a local saying that there was some uh, beautiful quartz. He called it quartzite, but uh, this looks to be uh, just a, a, a very large quartz vein. Give me a width again of the vein, Bryce. Um, Roughly. Four and, a half feet. four and a half feet wide. Yeah, so it's maybe more like a dike than a, than a, than a vein. Um, but you know, the focus isn't great here, but... Uh, pretty sure that was within the Swakane Biotite, nice bedrock that's that's just north of Kashmir, and, and uh, we're not going to get into that uh, exotic terrain material a whole lot. But anyway, this might go along with the video that you see this weekend called Kashmir Overlook. Thanks. All right. Well, good. So you brought some in. Thank you. Were you disappointed? Were you pleased? Was it worth the effort up there? Blocks big blocks of it. Yeah, oh, yeah. So Almost uh, like that block down by where we parked. Yeah, it was that, that was a big piece. And then, so Did, this is where I kind of, there, I didn't take a good picture of it, mm -hmm. but this is where I picked out these pieces. Mm -hmm. Just a huge one. This is kind of where the main vein is, I think. It definitely looks like um, that whole area was, it was dug it out. Was just, so it was pr hundreds pr and these hundreds of these pieces just piled right Yeah, there. but there's definitely signs of someone probably up there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, which is what I assume that pile is. Uh huh. Um, and then... Yeah, you guys had the scent. You, you took off you like, a, like a shot. Yeah, shirt. and then just all I along... Wish I, uh, I, they're I, heroes. On my way over all here, I had a hill. piece in my backpack, but I left it just at like home. But he brought some, yeah. There was a little pile there, but just down the hillside, there was just... 
as you kept hanging up, you just kept finding more and more and more. There were just pieces so cool. and pieces. Look at this right here. Everywhere. Did you see any nice? Yeah. Like the, the bedrock that we were looking at earlier? You didn't see any of that. I think so. Maybe. Like a piece. Maybe. So you saw outcrop of, so maybe that's more resistant and it was more an outcrop former and then the, the, the nice was kind of a big kind of recessed a little bit and not obvious. And there's just big blocks and big blocks of the stuff all You were locked on. You were locked on. Every every time you looked at the ground, which is all you were doing when you're hanging uphill, mm -hmm. but it was just... Oh, yeah, it was. He's there. He's there. Been a long time ago. Okay, so, we're going back. Yeah. I need some of that. Oh, you are? Good. Yeah, I need some of that. I was like, I wouldn't mind just grabbing more. We just got to find the elevator. I know. It's it's miserably Yeah. John seemed like a like a can-do guy. He'll probably build an escalator for us. Okay, cool. Awesome. Really awesome. Cool I'll keep that. my eye out on the email then. Yeah, I'm just waiting for Carl to send me some coordinates. Okay, sounds cool. Oh, Tim, you're going out with that? Yeah, Good. Yeah, yeah. Going out on, I'm going out on everything. You had me a boy. Carl talked with uh, Dr. Ely's class too, so I think we got like, like 10 people or something. Oh, like, awesome. Plus cool. two of the guys that already helped me with my research last summer that kind of know the system and everything too so we're gonna have a good crew you got a lot of, you got so a lot of are you going to be training the volunteers on using the ground penetrating radar yeah absolutely is cool. it easy to teach um it's a little harder than i don't know if anybody's worked with dr Ely's setup but for geology a lot of times it's on the cart uh -huh. that you push um but for any terrain that's more difficult than a flat field, you right. need the setup where you're carrying two antennas. Oh. And uh, people will learn how to set those up, yeah. take them down, because we're going to different mm -hmm. sites. So it'll be yes. uh, setting up a whole the, uh, uh, the system and then taking it down each oh, time. Oh, I've never been the brute force. Very cool. So Very practical. Oh, really? Oh, well, Carl's. That's no, mine. It's just Nick. I love that he leaves around to hurt his bone. Like, it's clearly straight hair. vodka, right? You're just missing the olive. <laughs> Will you be returning to yesterday's field site anytime soon? Probably. My daughter really wants to go out there and see it. I can't say for sure, but I'll bet you another week and those that those flowers will be gone. Really? I think so. So I'll have to take her up there. Possibly. Maybe if you can Friday. swing it this weekend or... Like tomorrow? Or, yeah, or, yeah, I'll probably end up going up yeah. Friday then. Because yeah. I think that's one of the things that she thought mm -hmm. was like super mm -hmm. cool. But I can, so she's like a mini version of me, but like way more fit because she's into soccer and stuff. But yeah. I bet she would have a lot of fun trying to find Sure. Her. Oh, to go up to the vein. The vein, yeah. 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 All right. Well, good. You, you let me, well, good. You let me know if you go. I'd be curious. Get a little, get a little report. Oh, we got to get started. Geology 351 is in session. Most of you are here. It's a beautiful afternoon. I understand a few might be playing hooky for, I guess, obvious reasons, but I feel like we want to earn our weekend or even this afternoon. It is glorious outside. Please, please go sit in the sun. Please go read in the sun. Please go spend these days. If you're not in our valley regularly, we don't get stretches like this that often. Usually the wind is howling. So this is, this is just a great experience for us. So, sorry to interrupt into your entertainment programming there, Ray. Okay, so we are beginning. We're locking in. I've asked for a little bit more sharpness than last time. And I have good news, I hope. And the good news is, I have a plan today. I have a narrative today. And, and of course, it's there that you're copying down. And your part of this is to feed data, to feed data uh, as we work our way through this data collection from Celestia. So basically, I'm doing the steering today, and you're hopefully interacting with me as we compile these dates and this other stuff. And I've got some new information as well. It's not a complete rehash, of course, I had some plans last time and I, I didn't get there. Um, even with the model, we have more than one potential model today. I'm gonna to come to you and think if we can think in real time and that would be a sweet thing if we could do that. 
Also, I need to designate a timekeeper today. Who can help me keep track of time? You're going to shut me up at 12, at 1.40 because I want a good 10 minutes of animation. Ryan, you're on the clock. So you're just going to belt out whatever uh, if I'm still, if I've lost track of time because I've got four good animations, one directly from Ray Wells, the author of the paper today, and I want to make sure we have time to look at that. So that's you, Ryan. Don't forget about it. Thank you for doing that. Couple more minutes to give you a chance to look at the chalkboard. I'm reminding you, I have not heard from most of you by email. Most of you have not emailed me the homework, the Emily Cahoon homework. Uh, I don't know what's going on these days with you youngsters. It feels like it's a contest how late I can submit the thing before five o'clock tomorrow. And then I get the thing at 5.10. You've had the assignment for eight days. I get it at 5.10. I said, sorry, deadline was at 5 o'clock. I sent it at 4.58. I, I, I can prove it. I sent it at, like, fucking, you sent it 90 seconds ago. You had eight days. What are you doing? So please, the weather's nice. Some of you have gotten on it, but please, we only have a few of these homework assignments by email. Do it quickly now. It's not that extensive. The procrastination thing, I just don't get to a certain point. So let's get into a, a better uh, vibe there, please. Okay, um, enjoyed yesterday with most of you. I'll be posting that video this weekend. I'm not going to see you again until Tuesday of next week. So without further ado, let's get to it. You've got this written down. You'll prompt me a little bit because this is going away, but this is almost like a laundry list for me to remember how I want to tell this story. And before... We get right to the Wells paper. I want to add one phrase that Camp and Wells used. Um, and I haven't used it to this point, but I want to use it not only now, but uh, it will come back and help us once we get to central Washington. Flare up. Flare up. Like my rheumatism has, has flared up. I was sitting on the front porch. I had a little flare up. So I'm not going to go back and do this all again. This is how I got behind last time. But you remember we had our three episodes of lavas in central Oregon, eastern Oregon, western Oregon. You remember them. And we talked about the mid-Miocene where we had all this freak show activity, bimodal volcanism, rhyolites as well as basalts and everything in between. Let's call that a flare-up. And that flare-up was tied tectonically. I'm not, I'm not too brave yet to come to you. That flare-up was tied tectonically to a break in the Farallon Plate. This was last time. We broke the Farallon Plate 17 million years ago. We had a frickin' flare-up, baby. Alliteration. We had a frickin' flare-up. And by breaking that Farallon Plate, you have it in your notes from last time. When we broke the Farallon Plate, suddenly we had hot mantle getting shallower. And that hot mantle is either getting some basalts to the surface or getting some rhyolites, or both. And if you ask me for details of how we're getting the details of the bimodal volcanism from the, from the break-off, I don't have it for you. But that flare-up is a phrase we want. Yesterday, most of us were up above Kashmir. We're overlooking this area where we have Tianaway formation and outcrop. That's a flare-up, baby. It was an older flare-up and I can't hold it, we're going to break a plate during Tianaway formation time. So not only are we taking the scenic route to Siletia so far in this class, and then working our way towards the Kashmir area like we were yesterday, we're going to use some of these concepts, including breaking a slab and getting a bimodal flare-up as a result. Thank you for the head nods. That's encouraging. Wonderful. So... I want to get to Celestia. We've only had it like in this form so far, and we have this information as well. So I don't want to go back to that off the bat. I do want to come to this, and I come to you now. You tell me 56 to 48 one more time. What do those dates signify? Just anybody. 56 to 48 is what? Building of Celestia, thank you. We don't have any Celestia basalts until 56 million years ago. Now that I say that, I see what Andrew was on to. Andrew via Matthew last time was looking at these cartoons 
This is a blow up of one that you have from the handouts from last time. This is one of the featured diagrams, sexy diagram from the Wells paper. I still don't get this. Maybe somebody does, but uh, 56 is the beginning of our Silesia and Yakutat, large igneous province. Uh, Andrew was noticing we have older basalts going back to 64. Don't know. And by the way, Ray, Ray Wells did join us last time, the author of the paper. I sent him the link. So I don't know if he was watching live or he watched it immediately. You know what he said by email? Love the flashlight and the tracing paper. <laughs> Which I can't find. I look for the tracing paper. I can't find it. I put it somewhere. I can't find it. But anyway, that, 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 that felt good. So let's use 56 as our starting point for building of Silesia. New information. Did Silesia ever break sea level? Was it truly a large igneous province completely submarine? Or was there a time that Silesia built large enough to get its neck up above sea level? Is it a yeah? So first of all, is that a yes or no? What did it break the waves? Yes or no? It did. What evidence would we look for to convince ourselves that that's true? Or what evidence would we have with the Silesia basalts to prove that it was underwater? Okay. So dominantly, dominantly in the Silesia scene we have pillow basalts. If that's not clear to you, you know, you've, everything but the kitchen sink is in this paper. Again, we're talking about Wells 2014. And he has some beautiful field photos. Of course, I can't find them easily right now. Here. Where there's just massive amounts of pillows. Way more than our cute little pillows we had on the old Vantage Road, if you remember that field trip. You, you remember from 101, pillow basalts tell us that lava is interacting with water. In the case of central Washington, those were the Columbia River basalts, and the base of those individual CRB flows were dealing with fresh water, a temporary lake that was in central Washington. This is different, man. This is the Pacific frickin' ocean. And we are building from 56 until roughly 51. That's the date that I found. Does anybody have anything different? From the Wells paper, 56 to 51 is pillowed, is submarine. We're a large igneous province, offshore, underwater, but it's pillows dominantly, maybe exclusively. But there are some places that you can look at Silesia basalt. 51 to 48. I'm not going to write it all out. You can take good notes. I'm basically saying Silesia broke the waves, emerged from the sea 51 million years ago. 56 to 51, you build this thing from the ocean floor up to sea level. And then in the last 3 million years of its activity, 51 to 48, the thing emerges. We lose the pillows. What might we look for in the Silesia basalts that prove that it was not submarine, but it was subaerial, meaning that was lava is actually extruding onto the surface, onto uh, into the air as opposed to underwater? Yes. So again, beautiful photos from the Wells paper, and he has some places where we have some rather impressive breaches, or we actually have some columns. That's what Andrew just said. Let's just use that. These beautiful columnar basalt, like we saw with the Drumheller columns field trip last week. Much larger scale, but we do have a transition from submarine to subaerial, meaning underwater to uh, above sea level at 51 million years ago. We good? Now, these dates are not talking about that. These dates, 51 to 49, are talking about what? Accretion. We've done this like three different lectures now. We know this. A couple things to say. First of all, this thing's still erupting as it's accreting. That's kind of a cool concept. We know accretion means to add on to. So, we're st so part of the... I'm kind of spitballing. I can't help it. 
Possibly part of the reason we're emerging from the ocean is because we're accreting, right? I mean, 51 is when we start emerging from the water, and that's basically the time that we're accreting the thing. But nonetheless, it's a, I guess, a two million year process of slowly adding this chocolate gumdrop from the ocean onto the edge of North America. Accretion, 51 to 48. And some sort of heat sources nearby. Now we're going to get caught in some problems with models, at least for my brain and maybe yours too, but let's be disciplined. We're sticking with the data and what we for sure know mostly from Ray Wells' work, but others have contributed, of course, as well. Uh, that's the ages that I wanted to cover. Now, you have the color handout from last time, and you're a good student, so you still have it. If you didn't catch it, I always have extras in the back, but for now, you're stuck. I don't want you getting up and moving around. Uh, you have a two-sided guy, and one side looks like this, which I really like. It's not from the Wells 2014 paper. It's from Wells and somebody else. And I don't even know the date, but I like it, so I want to use it. You've got it in front of you. Our neighbor has it. Let's highlight a couple things. First of all, where geographically are we again? Here's one way to do it. So I'm sorry the colors are going to be confusing now. So I'm taking, I'm taking your green and I'm making it red. Um, locally... You can be in BC on the southern tip of Vancouver Island with the Machosan basalt. Or you can be in western Washington with the Crescent basalt. Or you can be in western Oregon with the Siletz River volcanics. That's all Siletzia. Those are local names that for decades were just simply local formations. No real regional story. I mean, it's not really till wells that we understand this is an exotic terrain and that sort of thing. So the 56 to 48, that's what we're talking about here. But if we drill down and look more carefully at our green shades, I think it's obvious, but let's just make sure. The light green is Siletzia in the subsurface, and you can see the fine print so you can see where we are geographically, including upside down again. I did this last, thank you, Andrew. I did that late last time too. I'm like, you idiot, just look. Turn it up. All right. The dark green are where we have outcrops. But again, I love this. I love where we don't have individual postage stamps. I want to group the postage stamps and have tell a bigger story. And as we discussed kind of casually last time, we're talking about a hell of a lot. Sorry, Patrick. A hell of a lot, hell of, a lot of Celestia basalt from the coast, even off the coast, into the subsurface encroaching the Cascade Volcanic Arc that we have today. According to some of the geophysics, much of this uh, subsurface Siletzia basalt is here to Ellensburg. It's a regional story. And when we get to volumes in a second, I think we're probably underselling the original volume of the Siletzia basalt because we have such a limited amount of exposure and geophysics is difficult and sketchy and fuzzy as you go down deeper. So that's the difference between the light green and the dark green. But tell me about the yellow blotches, please, someone. Tim, they're much a young volcanic. Have we talked about them? They have. Which volcanics are these? These yellow blotches in the middle of the green. That's the Tillamook, baby. That's the Tillamook. So, I don't know. Do I want to go through the whole thing? I don't think I do. But the yellow blotches on your green handout, you're with me, aren't you? Are the Tillamook episode lavas. I'm setting you up for a model discussion. So, we're going back to last time. Tillamook episode, what are the dates? 42 to 34. Thank you for being sharp today. Energy is much better today. I really appreciate it. So now we're talking about the Tillamook episode. You're like, well, wait, I thought we were talking about Siletzia. Well, we are. And your handout is green, different shades of green. That's Siletzia. But I want to make sure you see the Tillamook episode lavas. Look at the dates, 42 to 34. 
are coming up through Silesia. So geographically, these Tillamook episode lavas are, are in Silesia's scene, but there's some important distinctions. I almost want to do it with you right now, but I, I have to stay disciplined. I'm talking to myself now. Well, be well behaved, boy. Ryan's going to give you the hook. Just, just stay, stay with the plan. So the Tillamook episodes, yellow colored on your diagram, are emerging out of these fissures, cracks, feeder dikes. So you're like, oh shit, are we doing this again? Seriously? Yeah, we are, because I was hesitant last time, but I've got it now. Originally, here are the feeder dikes feeding the Tillamook episode, the yellow blotches. Give me some local names. It's not only the Tillamook vo volcanics, but there's two others. The cat, what? Cascade Head. And mm. River. Gray's River and the Yachats. Those were the three we had in your notes buried a couple days ago. Tillamook episode is more than just the Tillamook volcanics. Those other yellow blotches, some of them are in Washington, the Gray's River volcanics. That's part of this Tillamook episode and the Yahats basalts. So these uh, cracks are part of the story, but I'm, I'm not ready to play with it just a touch. I'm still talking about data, and as we discussed last time, originally these cracks that made the Tillamook episode lavas were oriented northwest, <clears throat> were oriented northeast, southwest originally, but you know what we're going to do. We have good data from the orientation of the dikes. More importantly, we have good uh, data from paleomagnetic information. Not worth a whole different discussion, but it's not. I, I want to, but I don't want to. So there is good bedrock data that these original fissures of the Tillamook episode have been rotated more than 45 degrees away from their original orientation. This is the one I held upside down as we finished last time. Again, from the Wells paper. We're talking about data. We're not talking about why. We're just saying back in the Eocene, our Tillamook episode feeder dikes were North, east, south, west, and today they are north, west, south, east. They have been rotated over the last 42 million years. But it's not just the feeder dikes that have been rotated or moved. I guess the same thing, right? If you're rotating western Oregon crust, you're, you're, you're not only rotating, but you are moving north. I was too casual last time. I said 300 kilometers. I reread the paper. Do you have a distance? 250. In his abstract, Wells 2014 says there's 250 kilometers of um, northward movement in a rotation sense away from original position. So... What is now Seletzia's bedrock going from the southern tip of Vancouver Island down to central Oregon, we need to move, I'm talking about Seletzia now, we need to move Seletzia's bedrock 250 kilometers further south. I'm hoping that you can see these major narratives that are coming from this paper. I know that it's a dense paper. I know there's tons of stuff in there. You just stand back and go, God dang, that guy did a hell of a job with that paper. But maybe if you had 30 years of work on a topic, you'd have a paper like that too. I don't know. So my job is to just try to find some basic things that we can sink our teeth into, but also, you know where we're headed. I've said this once before. I want to say it again right now. This Seletzia story is a major reason we will see our geology in central Washington. 
Otherwise, I wouldn't be spending a second full day on this. What else is on your outline for data? What else was I hoping to discuss? Ages, what else? Volume, oh, volume, I, this is meaningless to me. So let me cover it. Uh, I'm never a huge numbers guy because everybody goes, whoa, whoo, big. It's like, you can't picture it. I can't picture it. The number that keeps coming up as I look around and try to estimate the volume of Celestia. And I have to say it. It's not just Celestia, right? We have a... Hang on, Patrick. Here. I'll give you one quick map from Alaska. So there are major strike-slip faults. Those are the red lines. Major faults like the San Andreas Fault, where we have earthquakes continuing today on these major active strike-slip faults. And there's an active... <laughs> This back. There's a uh, strike slip fault here called the Fairweather Queen Charlotte or the Queen Charlotte Fairweather Fault. It is a major strike slip fault. And crust that is on the west side of the Queen Charlotte Fault has been moving north with each San Andreas fault like earthquake. Guess who's been moving? It's freaking Yakutat. So you're like, what? You're telling me that's Yakutat? Yes, I am. What am I saying? I'm saying this is more of the large igneous province. This is 56 to 48. This is pillows until 51. This is the whole thing that was originally here off the coast of California. So when we're estimating volumes, which is what got me into this, we can't just look at your green map and look at Celestia. There's another half of this thing that has been sent north up to Alaska. So, 2 times 10 to the 6 kilometers cubed. I don't even bother writing it down. I don't, it's on par with... A, thank you. Bryce, did you do that? Bryce, wow. <laughs> nice job. Megan. Yep. Now that is a wow that has some genuine nature to it. I have used that. Megan is reporting kind of what Wells was able to do to talk about volume. I think I've said this quickly. Um, He's got up to 12 times the volume of the Columbia River basalt group total. All the basalts in eastern Washington, eastern Oregon, we're talking about 12 times the volume. On the scientific papers list, I added this. doesn't have a star. You're not responsible for it. But I added this from Wells 2012, which is basically just a bunch of slides he was working on. I printed them all out. Some of them are familiar from the paper, but this is two years before his 2014 paper. And he's got up to 14 times the volume of the CRBs in this 2012 document. I don't know if he meant to downgrade it or not. So you're right, Megan. That, that is a more effective way to compare. But what I want to go to, and this is what I'm totally un, uh, I'm in the dark about, and I don't expect any of us right here are going to solve this, but maybe our home audience would have some ways to help some of us out. Um, if we're talking about this volume of Celestia plus um, Yakutat, that's on par with some of these other large igneous provinces worldwide. That's a message that's pretty easy to say. We talked about one, the Antong Java Plateau, large igneous province that's no longer active. I got pretty basic questions. Is Iceland a large igneous province? Like, look at this, look at the way, I just ordered this and just got it. It's a nice kind of canvas thing of, of Marie Tharp's famous uh, map. Look at, so look at Iceland and how, oh shit. A home audience, look at Iceland first. Now you guys, well, Bryce is still wowing, you smart ass. Just kidding. 
Is that a large igneous province? Does the volume of the Iceland complex, not just the island itself, not just the current eruption, we all know that. But like, I've never been, I guess I haven't looked that hard to be honest. But can we take this whole thing that appears on Marie's map and quantify it? Are we, is that truly a large igneous province? Uh, Hawaii, I don't need to show you that. That's not a large igneous province, is it? The big island of Hawaii, it's a mantle plume. How come that's not a huge large igneous province? I was talking to Bryce after class and Emma last time, and Bryce is immediately like, well, because the plate's moving. Okay, do all large igneous provinces have to be at a plate edge then? Do we have to be fixed? Like if, we're, if we have a mantle plume and a moving plate, like Hawaii most famously, aren't we constantly moving the ocean floor and there's not enough time to build up this Celestia slash Yakutat volume? And you're like, well, come on, you're teaching the class. What's the answer? I don't think we know. And if we do, it's not obvious to me what we know. Tim really wants to say something. Hey, uh, Go ahead. Uh, good, good. Yeah. Right, this. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Tim. So not only on your outline today, but Tim is also bringing up the fact, look, we got a spreading ridge on these maps. Why aren't you talking about the spreading ridge? Why don't you have a spreading ridge offshore of, of the Pacific Northwest? There was a spreading ridge. And up until this point, I've tried to stay away from it. But we're going there. So I'm going to read, I'm spitballing just a, uh, no, no, I'm not, no, stay, stay, dis I only have 10 minutes, are you freaking kidding me? All right. Ryan, if you speak, I'm going to, I'm just kidding. All right. All right. All right, I gave you the volume thickness, I think we said this last time, 20 kilo 25 kilometers thick. We're talking about this large igneous province, this oceanic plateau out in the water, 25 kilometers thick. You're like, wow, okay. Well, ocean crust in general is like seven kilometers thick on average. And so we're underplating, we're loading, I don't know, but, but we're, we're talking about a substantially uh, thicker piece of the ocean floor uh, that has been built into this large igneous province. I'll, I'll do it verbally because I'm running out of time with our data. Uh, there are some isotopic details in the Celestia basalt that says mantle plume. I'll do it verbally. Osmium. Ever heard of it? Me neither. Hayden has. I'll just read it. Osmium 187 versus osmium 188. That ratio of the two isotopes of osmium. Oh, shit, that's high. Oh, mantle plume all the way. Helium 3 versus helium 4. Another isotope ratio high all i'm trying to say because i don't know much geochem there are some details not only helium but osmium that are apparently a significant tell for a mantle plume source and by the way they're not just in the celestia basalts but apparently they're in the tillamook episodes mantle plume beneath and even according to emily cahoon you remember she had some I don't know if she had osmium, but she had helium she was talking about. Okay. Uh, okay, I am done with the data, and I want to transition in the last few minutes I have before Ryan cuts me off and go to an email from Ray Wells. And this is basically after discussing with Andrew, I think it was uh, after class or during class, I can't remember. But we're, we're transitioning just a little bit to the model, and that's what the animations are going to do for us as well. The animations are going to help us with some visuals and some models. Here's my question to Ray Wells, and maybe you're kind of flirting with it as well, some of you. 
Silesia, we'll just call it Silesia, you know what I mean. Silesia was on the mantle plume, right? Right. The Yellowstone hotspot's fixed, right? Right. So did Silesia move or not? 56 to 48, we're building this large igneous province, but did that thing start drifting? Or was it just hanging there on top of the mantle plume? I didn't totally have that question straight in my mind until talking to a few of you. And you're like, who cares? Well, there's a gap in the ages, right? When are we done building Silesia? What's the, de what's the number? 48 million years ago, we are done building Silesia basalts. 48. What's our date for North America starting to uh, drift over the stationary mantle plume, the flashlight? 42. We have a six million year gap between finishing the building of Silesia and drifting North America over the stationary plume. Are some of you seeing what I'm at least asking? I'll say it one more time. There's a six million year gap between building Silesia and North America crossing the Yellowstone mantle plume. Who can think with me? If the, if the large igneous province, if Silesia didn't move, if it was stationary, what would you expect for the ages of Silesia versus the ages of the Tillamook episode? Go ahead. Yes, you wouldn't have a gap, I don't think. I don't think you would have this gap, this lag between building Silesia and then having... Remember, it's the Tillamook episode lavas. I'll do it on this map. It's the Tillamook episode lavas that are coming through. They were originally like this. Coming through Silesia. I said this a couple lectures ago, and I think a couple of you were pushing back. Like, what? are you sure that like... Silesia is being made, it's being accreted, and then the hot spot is burning a hole through the thing that it made? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. I'm pretty sure that is the story. So if you're waiting for it, Ray Wells answered my email, pretty immediately, by the way, on Monday morning. Nick, thanks for the question. Assuming a long-lived Yellowstone hotspot and a northeast trending spreading ridge. Ignore it, Tim. Tim, ignore it. The, geo, the geochem argues, arg, the geochem arguments suggest involvement of a spreading ridge. Tim, I told you, get off the spreading ridge thing right now. Yellowstone hotspot could be on or near the ridge. Stop it. Here it is. In either case, in either case, if the mantle plume is on a spreading ridge or underneath the Farallon plate, Wells says, in either case, the product of volcanism on the Farallon side of the ridge would be moving with the Farallon plate with respect to the hotspot. In all cases, it's actively moving towards North America. So if you've zoned out for a second, in our class so far, we are trying to visualize options. We're talking about models now. We've gone through the data. We're trying to option, talking about plate tectonic options. And on Tuesday, we're going to talk about ocean plates. That's what I thought I was going to do today, but I'm pushing to Tuesday. We're going to talk about more options. But what if our mantle plume and what if the majority of our large igneous province is not centered on a spreading ridge, which almost certainly is in the area, but we're ignoring because I'm just trying to think of what it would be like if we have this mantle plume completely or most of it on the Farallon plate. The short answer is we're going to move this bad boy. It's not just North America coming at Silesia. We have six million years, according to Ray, of Silesia coming towards North America as well. And it's not until 42 that we actually have North America cross the mantle plume and we have our feeder dikes cracking Silesia that was built six million years earlier offshore. Head nods abound in the room. That's encouraging. And I believe your head nods. 
Who wants to say something in response to that? Again, I, um, pretty much Tuesday is spreading ridge time. Let me focus on the spreading ridge. So maybe we'll get off the spreading ridge a little bit. Ryan? Thank you. Two minute warning from Ryan. I like it, Ryan, but I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do with that. So Ryan's just doing what most of us would do. Can I, can I take this and, 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 and go to Hawaii today? Can I go to Iceland today? Can I go to the Galapagos today? What kind of modern parallels can I work with to help kind of eliminate some choices? That's been done ad nauseum with this work, uh, but I, I, I don't know how to do that. I, don't, I haven't figured out what we can do yet because I don't even know if... We, Listen, man, do we have a large igneous province active today or not? Yes or no? Is it Iceland? Well, then let's work with it. That's a spreading ridge. But we don't have a continent heading towards Iceland that's about to overtake the Iceland mantle plume, for instance. Make it quick, Tim. Yep. I'm going to cut you. So we have different mantle plumes, Tim says. Is it, is, is it okay just to go from mantle plume to mantle plume and assume they're all identical? Uh, some are truly in the ocean. Some are truly under a continent. Many have transitioned, as this has, from an ocean setting, and then suddenly the thing finds itself underneath a, a monster. That's us, North America. And we've already talked about how this mantle plume has uh, different signatures because it's dealing with not only ocean plate, but Celestia, after it accreted, accreted terrains of eastern Oregon, and then the craton of Wyoming. All right, right? Okay. So I'm done. And what we are doing with our last 10 minutes, thank you, Ryan, is we want to put this in motion. So as Bryce pointed out last time, Wells is playing with three different sources uh, or positions of the Yellowstone hotspot. One, on the spreading ridge, two, off center of the spreading ridge. But I think we need an animation. And Ray emailed me uh, an email, uh, an animation that's about 10 years old. And he says the plate reconstruction models have, have changed a little bit. But he says, you know, I, he didn't say it this way. He's like, I'm retired. I don't, I don't have time to redo the animation. And so admittedly, it's a, it's a bit crude. But we can learn some things. And I've watched this thing probably 20 times in the last 48 hours. And so I need to play with the cameras here just a little bit. I want to zoom in with the home crowd. And since I'm being finicky with the cameras and everything, we're going to look at more than just uh, a Wells animation. We're going to look in cross-section from Jenda Johnson, who is a very well-known animator. Um, you want to go to a great YouTube channel, go to Iris Earthquake Science YouTube. Iris, like in your eyeball, I-R-I-S, all caps. Iris Earthquake, I think, or I Earth, Iris Earthquake Science. It's all Jenda's work, and she lives in Portland, and she's been trying to show this Celestia story from a side view, not a map view. Okay, so I've, what did I just do here? Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, widescreen. Yes, those guys are close. You guys are coming in pretty tight as well. That's as close as I can get you guys. I forgot my, oh man. Uh, let's get rid of the live stream. We're gonna try it, baby. And now Apple TV opens. I've, I've never used Apple TV in my life. Why does that keep popping up? I wanna use QuickTime. You feel like you're like at your dad's house right now? Why does this phone make all these sounds? I'll let it play once.
forgot my remote, so I'll have to struggle here a little bit. So this is your cheat sheet, of course. And there's a lot on here, and it's it's a it's a it's a movie file. I don't know how to share it with everybody online, but uh, let me try to stop and start this thing. Play. All right. So what are the different shades of yellow? Ages of the ocean floor. So the red is a spreading ridge. So it's a little sneak peek to next time. Everyone, I don't care who you are, everyone agrees that during this time of Siletia, in the neighborhood was a northeast-southwest trending submarine ridge, a spreading ridge, a plate boundary. It's too much for us today, in my opinion to deal with the, the ramifications of that. But what we do have is the white dot, which is our stationary flashlight going through the, tra the tracing paper. And this, there's dates up here. This is 60 million years ago. Okay, I'm gonna... Green is our large igneous province. And I think it's light green when you're on a different plate than North America and it turns to dark green when you start taking a ride with North America. And immediately we have our two guys. I don't understand why they're separate. I thought it was one big large igneous province and then they get split by the Queen Charlotte Fault, but what do I know? Then we accrete, according to Ray's, and again, this is maybe 10 years old, five years old, I don't know, He's accreting Siletia before he's accreting Yakutat. I guess because he's, he's got these two parts of the large igneous province on opposite sides of this spreading ridge. We have two different ocean plates traveling at different speeds, maybe, or different vectors at least. Now they're both green. They've both been accreted. So let's think of that. I don't know. There's not. Did anybody catch me? There's not. There, did he talk much about the accretion of Yakutat? Like, is Yakutat truly accreting after Siletia? Are they both being accreted 51 to 49? I never thought about that till right now. And this guy Mike Eddy, that will be you know worshiping for the month of May, uh, is involved in this as well. So we'll keep coming back to Siletia details. Did someone want to say something there? Let's keep, I'll just keep. So we still have Yakutat and Siletia in the Pacific Northwest. We haven't sent Yakutat heading towards Alaska yet. And the date, I'm reading backwards, I think that says 44 million years ago. In fact, we haven't even slipped the hotspot beneath yet, have we? 42 is when we slip over, or when the hotspot slips beneath us. Doink, there it is. Uh-oh, what do we got? Yellow. We got our Tillamook episode lavas coming up through cracks within the accreted Siletia, but with Geochem saying that the hotspot's right beneath. And that's why we're dating that accretion, sorry, that's why we're dating our, our, dating our override of North America over the hotspot plume at 42. And uh, Yakutat's on its way north. I guess back to this light green because it's, it's taking a ride on uh, an ocean plate we'll talk about on, on uh, Tuesday. Ryan, was it you? Right. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't know how to explain why, why he's doing some of that. It's, it's crude for sure. I think one thing I'm realizing right now is that I'm setting up for Tuesday and why we need to reconstruct certain ocean plates. Like how else would you explain half of this thing heading to Alaska? You need an ocean plate to do the moving. You need a, a conveyor belt basically. And you're like, well, where's the conveyor belt today? Well, maybe it's totally gone. Ocean plates can totally subduct. As we've said before, we can find them in the mantle, but 
They can totally go away. The word kula does mean all gone. But we do have these ocean plates that everyone agrees were a thing, and everyone agrees they ain't with us anymore. And you can see the challenges then of trying to reconstruct different times about which plate is doing which at what time. And you're like, ah, it's a bunch of academic masturbation. Oh, there's real impacts on not only understanding our geology here in the Pacific Northwest, but if you need to do it this way, economic benefits as well, looking for oil and natural gas, even seismic history and therefore seismic futures. So I don't know, maybe somebody will make a, a little bit more uh, polished, I don't know, or maybe this will change a little bit now that we've learned more about uh, plate reconstructions, but we'll, we'll try our hand at this again a little bit in some form next time. Anybody else want to say anything there? We're going, we're going to a couple more animations because I think I have the setup as about as good as I can. Now, right before the pandemic began, we're good? Anybody want to say anything? Thank you for your energy today. Even if you're not speaking, the energy is different. So Jen is this gal that makes animations, and she's a geologist, but she does this almost uh, full-time now. I think she does do it full-time. And right before the pandemic, about a year and, I don't know, 14 months ago, she said, I'm a fan of what you're doing. I'd like to make one of these animations for you. And I'm like, I'm working on this demise of the Farallon plate thing right now. It was a public lecture I was going to give, which never happened, of course. And I said, so we got started on this back and forth a little bit by email. And this is the rough version she had. And then the pandemic hit and we just haven't finished it. So what is she showing? She's first of all showing a break off of the Farallon plate. And she's showing the birth of the Cascades. Can I get this focused any better on your dark? So I want to show this. So that's kind of the slow motion version. And we were onto something, but I didn't know the details that I needed at the moment. Tim, hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to show you a more polished version. And this one does exist on YouTube. Uh, it's called this. If you want to see this whole thing and go on YouTube again to that Iris YouTube channel, or you just type this into YouTube, Cenozoic Volcanism in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, there's a lot going on. This is Agenda collaboration with Anita Grunder at Oregon State University. But, and I'm going to play the whole thing, I guess. And I'll talk as it's going. But it's trying to deal with all these crazy lavas in the Pacific Northwest. And there's one portion of this. There's the iris that I can show you. There's one portion of this that, that is important. And it's, I'll give it to you verbally before it actually happens. So Jen is starting with real-time geography. Here's where the cascades are. Here's what the plates are that we have on the planet today. And then she's magically going to go back in time. Oh, she's showing the basin range, stuff like that. The main point from this that I want to dwell on is that when you accrete Celestia, you're going to choke the subduction zone. What did we say? 25 kilometers thick of ocean material? You're not going to send that down a subduction zone. That's not going to all go down the, the hole. And so we're going to clog or we're going to choke the subduction zone with the Celestia and the ramif... I think she could have made Celestia a lot bigger personally. But here's what she's going to do. A Crete Celestia when? 51 to 49. But the ocean plate's not going to stop. And if we totally clog or choke the trench or choke the subduction zone, we're going to break the Farallon plate. We're going to start a new frickin' trench further west. We're going to jump the position of the trench, and that ultimately sets up the cascades that we know and love today. Then there's some sort of flare-up business and progressions that we may or may not get to in eastern Washington in May. But I want to replay that portion. Do you want to ask now about this? Tim, do you still have what you wanted to say? Cross section. Which one of the 
Uh, I don't know. We didn't probably get that far. I think she was giving me ideas, and then I, I, we kind of ran out of time. Here, I'm going to stop and start. 51, accrete. Now, notice two major events, and we're going to keep coming, but I'll probably be, you'll probably be sick of this one. I'm already two minutes over, but give me an extra few, couple minutes, would you? Two things are happening right here with the accretion of Silesia. Break off. I don't need to sing it again, do I? Break off the Farallon plate and begin violent no from Megan and create a new trench. Create a new volcanic arc. Shift the position of the volcanic arc. And all sorts of havoc happening in the back arc as a result of that major change. And again, to be picky, I think she could have made Silesia like five times bigger, maybe even more than that, in, in, in not only map view, but cross-section view. Uh, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm already over time. Um, Ryan can talk to me after class. For the rest of you, I really appreciate and enjoyed your energy today. We did what I had planned today. And believe it or not, I had all that planned for last time, and that was ridiculous. So I feel like we're there. We go to ocean plates. We go to tomography on Tuesday. And a special shout out to those that traveled a long way to get here today. Thank you. We'll see you on Tuesday. Enjoy the weekend. Get outside, please. For the love of God, get outside. I'll visit with Ryan and a few others, and then we will uh, do some live Q&A as we always do. I don't really ever have a sense of how many are watching at the peak time, and then I never have a sense of how many people tune out at this point. If Actually, if you wanted to do that, that'd be helpful. What was our peak viewing number live? And then do we lose, what, 200 or something as you wait for the live q and I'm just curious. Be with you in a second. Cool. Uh, so you were saying how you were wondering about the accretion time. Yeah. I actually wrote a, a small bit down here. Um, Sister Plateau. Uh, the easy and basalt basement of the uh, Yucatan terrain now right. in Alaska, cool of the resurrection plate, and accreted along the... So, in the text of this, it yeah. seemed like it was saying that they were forming at the exact same, same. time. The accreting, accreting, accreting at, at the, the same, same time. time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he had a little leg on the animation, but I wonder if he's gotten away from that or. Yeah, I wasn't sure because it, okay. showed, it seemed to show them separately in the right. animation. Right. Right. But. Um, Good notes there. According to this, this yeah. seems to think that it was Good. the other way around. I'll try to zero in on that. Thank you. Yes, sir. I was just wondering. So, is it when we're talking about the. Is it amphibolites that are part of the oh God. Tillamook area where yeah. there's the plate that's blocking the hotspot? The Adakites. Adakites. Okay. Sorry. And that's, a, a, and that's not not really not, time that's time. not Tillamook. That's the stuff uh, in the back arc, a little further east and a little younger. That was right. between 30 and 20. I should have looked at the name of it. That's all right. That's okay. What I'm saying is, so there's, we have an ocean plate that's blocking the hotspot that's causing the what you just said. That's the model. Right. Adakites. Adakites. You think that's the remnants of the Farallon plate? Yes. After, so, okay. Yes. So it's it's just sticking around while the subduction is continuing. It's, it's, um, well, it's an interesting question. I think there's more than one break of the Farallon plate, number one, okay. in that, in that story. And which break is happening with the accretion of Silesia versus which break is happening to do our flare-up today, starting 17 million years ago. So let me think about that. I'm starting to get confused, like I think you are right now. I'm a, there's so much. There's a lot. There's a lot. You're doing really well. You're at a 108, man, or whatever. Or 101 with me, but not a whole lot more. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, well, Hayden is here, and he's going to be... Yeah, okay. So, um... With the... Um, that one that's including the... Yakutat. Yakutat up in Alaska. Um, I noticed in the maps and other things they list it as um, as a uh, as it like it hits the plate and then it drags up along it for a ways. Yes. I'm curious if you could see that and like fragments on the plate parts might have gotten ripped off as it's dragged along. I think along the Queen Charlotte Fault, there's no fragments. I think it's a clean break and it's being moved kind of like the San Andreas Fault, but. I'm also confident that up in central Alaska, you can see in the subsurface 
maybe half of Yakutat that's already been crammed into that corner. But as I mentioned, some of it's still being accreted. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a modern analog to what I guess we had in a way with the Silesia adding down here. Okay. Yeah. And I was also looking at the, sure. their, their depiction of the Wanda Fuqua Plate. Yeah. Kind of like cramming up against Canada uh, as it, the Pacific Plate moves north. The Wanda mm -hmm. Fuqua is still trying to go under and the Pacific mm -hmm. Plate is kind of just squishing it. Yeah. Um, some of that's real. I think some of that's like uh, the way we take a curved area and put it on a flat piece of paper. Yeah. But keep thinking about that. We'll try to reconstruct some of that in our mind on on Tuesday. Gals, hanging. Okay. I did go up that one spot, but I Thank you. Only went up to that first peak. You didn't get up to the quartz. You're you're no Bryce. I mean, none of us are really to Bryce's standard, but you did. You saw it. You got up high enough to see it. I don't know. Uh oh. When you get to that first spot, before you hike more, if you had looked up to the left a little bit, you would have seen two things on the right side. Oh, Bryce. Bryce, you're an animal. Oh, Tim's watching uh, Jenda's video right now. Nice. Okay. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah. Tim is... Tim's not going to sleep well tonight. He's he's into this. Uppercase, please, and we'll try to answer a few questions. Patrick is still here, it looks like. You got some questions? Death Mall, could other LIPs be attributed to plate breakoffs? I think what you're asking is, um, and I think what I'm saying, although I need to really think carefully, am I really saying this? That if you take a large igneous province from an ocean setting and you then try to subduct it, I don't see how you can avoid breaking off the ocean plate that's bringing it in. And so I think that's what you're asking, right? Any place in the world, if you, have, if you make a large igneous province in an oceanic setting and then you have uh, a continent uh, encroach that area, you're going to have to have a slab break off. I think you do. Never thought of it that way. And again, I, 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 I guess there's a, st what's the reunion hotspot story? Isn't the reunion hotspot used to be in an oceanic setting and then did it slip beneath India? I think it did. If, if that's true, that explains the Deccan traps, of course, but also, is there this slab breakoff thing there? Interesting. Thanks. I'm scrolling back here, as I am wont to do. Patrick, age seven. Do ocean and continental plates move at a constant rate their whole lives, at least until two continental plates collide? Good question, Patrick. Um, you, you remember a basic rule we have in geology, Patrick, that uh, we take what we can observe on the planet today and we assume that some of those basic laws remain uniform through time. And so since I teach 101, Patrick, I, I teach that plates are essentially pretty steady in their plate velocities, whether it's ocean plate or continental plates. But I don't know if we really know that. And I, I guess if we can... So here's where I lose it, Patrick. It seems in the geophysical community, there's still debate about whether mantle plumes drift a little bit or whether they are truly stationary. Let's say they're truly stationary and you have reference frames, then you can, I guess, measure plate velocity histories and you might come up with some acceleration or deceleration, but I'm out of my element there for sure. So generally, Patrick, let's just let's just think of these plates moving at a steady rate until we're forced to think otherwise. How about that? Kyle, no questions, Your Honor. Uh, thank you, Kyle. Uh, VIBC outdoorsman. So let's you're riding what plate? Crescent terrain and, and or Pacific terrain riding same plate. We'll do a little more with that, sir, uh, on Tuesday. 
But of course, it depends on which model you have. If you like the Yellowstone mantle plume off center of the spreading ridge, which we'll talk about on Tuesday, then the answer is Farallon. And basically, the Farallon has been uh, obliquely subducting beneath the western margin of North America for a long time. But there's massive debate right now about the position of that spreading ridge between the Farallon and whatever plate was to the north of it. I'm giving away part of Tuesday. but So it's a good question, but it's, it, it depends on who you talk to, I think, currently about which plate you want to put Celestia on. Most conventionally, it's the Farallon plate. Marbles Collector, what is the future of the East Pacific rise? Will it stop or move away since it can't penetrate the continent or stay underneath North America millions of years until the continent finally moves away? Well, kind of like Patrick's question, I'm going to assume current trends continue in the near future. And maybe there's reason that's a dumb thing to do. But if we think of the East Pacific rise as relatively stationary, again, that same comment that Maybe spreading ridges drift as well, but I can't handle everything moving at once. So if you're just willing to play along with me and have the East Pacific rise stationary, and then you have the North American plate drifting to the Southwest, I think we will be having more and more of the East Pacific rise slip beneath North America, or at least disappear from the Pacific Basin. Now that I say that, the most famous geologist in the history of this ocean Northeast Pacific Basin is Tanya Atwater, and I still remember her visiting Ellensburg and giving a talk in our department way, way, way back in the mid-1990s. And I put my little hand up and said, how many years in the future do you think the Juan de Fuca Ridge will slip beneath Washington? She says, I don't think it will. I think the, the Juan de Fuca Ridge is drifting away from North America. I'm like, all right. So I still remember that, and I still don't know what to do with that information, but she's uh, the authority. And maybe her answer would be different now versus 30 years ago. I don't know. Scrolling down to live. Tim, you, are you wanting to ask questions here? All right, you're, Tim's listening. Yeah, man. Papagino, can you go over to field tools like loops and color, grain charts? Well, I don't know. How, I'm going out in the field with Andrew tomorrow, Andrew Sadowski, and uh, I don't know how much he wants to be on camera. I'm going to bring my gizmo and my phone and a couple of mics, and um, I'll probably try to encourage him to be on camera. But And if he does, then we might do a little bit of that, but no promises. And he might say, no, 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 no. You're going to spend a day without being on a camera. Can you handle that as he's talking to me? Like, no. I film myself every morning having breakfast. Uh, Grandpa Carl, I'm going to probably do an Eocene A to Z series, maybe in the fall, winter, when the weather's crappy. There's too much beautiful weather right now and too many trails to get on, but... I'll probably take some of what I learned with this group and fold it into an Eocene alphabet series this fall. No promises. Uh, Mr. F. Miller, is that your dad? Uh, is the spreading ridge caused by the hotspot? I don't know. Somebody sent me a link to some guy from Texas A&M that gave a talk on, I guess it's the Shatsky Rise, which I know nothing about, but it's one of those oceanic plateaus in the Pacific. And he just had a couple of, it was like a oceanography type talk and they've gone out there and like drilled or mapped or I don't even know what. But of course they named one of these oceanic plateau, plateaus Tamu after Texas A&M University. I thought that was a little whatever, but I think one of his big points, I don't remember the guy's name, is that you can only make large igneous provinces at a triple junction. We have three ocean plates, so not only just a spreading ridge, but you need three spreading ridges intersecting, a triple junction in the water. 
And is it a chicken in the egg thing? I don't know. Are the spreading ridges there? And then you build this large igneous province, or is the large igneous province forming? And then you crack the ocean. You're talking to a rookie, man. I haven't thought about this at all. And some of you guys are, are very loyal and not only loyal, but very uh, energetic about learning things and you know, leaving comments or leaving links in the comments below this video or maybe emailing me. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'd be able to learn from some of you about this large igneous province stuff. But so far, I, I, I haven't. I, I did post one science paper from 15 years ago. Uh, you, you, science papers are here, colon link. You can click on that down below this video screen. Um, but that was not a very meaty paper, but it was a, kind of a large igneous province state of the union 15 years ago. So I'm just getting started on that. I think I'm down at live. Is Andrew with the man's... Uh, no, that's a different guy. That's Jeff Tepper, who we'll also talk about in this series. Some of you are veterans of watching the Nick on the Fly videos from last summer. Good times. Way too long. <laughs> These are like an hour long. David, so let's see, it does not appear to extend along the entire subduction zone. So how is the rest affected? So how is the rest affected? I don't know if I have your question. You're correct that so let's see, uh, today uh, is, is here. And it is not the same length as the current Cascadia Trench. But as I view it, the size of Celestia is a relic of, you know, at least 40 million years ago. And so there was a much different length of a trench or a subduction zone. So I wouldn't put those two things together if, I get, if I'm getting your question correctly. I'm sorry if I'm not. Oh, I'm hearing Jenda's voice again. Tim's going crazy over there. Carol, is there no subduction on the East Coast because the Atlantic is growing? Yes. Scrolling back, we'll do a few more. Uh, I don't really want to talk about the East Coast, sorry. Mabel, so the hotspot moved. Uh, in this discussion, I'm using the hotspot as a stationary heat source. You can look at the last show if you didn't see it. And I had a flashlight on my phone and I was holding the flashlight steady. Wasn't moving the flashlight, the mantle plume, the hotspot. And then I was moving North America over the top of it. That's the way we are visualizing mantle plumes with this Celestia story to this point. Jim wants to talk about slab tear and triple junction choking up, choking on LIP like Ecuador. I know the Galapagos mantle plume has uh, a spreading ridge and there are two ocean plates uh, heading towards the Americas. I don't know if there's a slab tear with that story. I don't get how the Caribbean large igneous province relates to the Galapagos mantle plume, but apparently it does. So breaking off the slab is the same as slab tear, I think, but maybe I'll change my tune as I read more there too. Scrolling back. Doug wants to ask about the Columbia embayment. That's a major question mark in my mind. Was the Columbia embayment formed by the spreading ridge associated with Celestia? Possibly, Doug, but as I talked about in the exotic terrain series, I don't really know what to do with that embayment. I'm not sure anybody does. Bill, the break in the plate, was it due to accretion or the Yellowstone hotspot? I cannot understand cause of the break. Uh, maybe I'll revisit that a little bit. That's what Tim's looking at right now, I think. Uh, I don't know how to put it into words. Uh, if, if we're... If this is the Farallon plate and it's subducting successfully... Uh, it's 
So here's the North American plate, and here's the Farallon plate. And if it's just the Farallon plate, just ocean crust, seven, seven kilometers thick, let's say, then we have successful subduction. And even as North America is drifting further to the west, the continental crust is going to win, and the ocean floor is going to lose by going back down into the mantle. Okay, fine. Now, what if I have a large igneous province, not just ocean floor, but a large igneous province of Silesia, uh, and we're bringing Silesia closer and closer until we finally start accreting the large igneous province 40, uh, 51 million years ago. And then we choke this whole scene like this, this this black cloth cannot go down with me, so, so we're going to break my arm and start a new trench over here. I think, whatever your name was, sorry, Bill, I think Bill's asking is, why do we have to have a break between my hand and my wrist? Why doesn't this just kind of hang here? Is that what you're asking, Bill? You can see why we changed the trench, right? You can see why we need a new trench and why, why we need to continue uh, subduction of my arm. But we're not going to keep subduction of my arm here because we, we've just changed the position of the coastline. We've changed the, we've accreted this huge large igneous province. I think I'm finally to the, the guts of your question, Bill, which is why don't we just have the old Farallon plate hanging there? And maybe it's a question of just the density of a slab, like it's just not going to stay hanging like some sort of appendage. It's going to break off, but I don't know the physics of that. But I hope we're communicating on the fact that we just can't continue to have the same old Farallon plate subduct at the same position because we, we gained all that real estate. Down to live, we'll do one more and we'll quit. Leslie, I don't understand why extension after Silesia rather than compression. Well, that's interesting. That's an excellent question. Um, I think it has to do with the orientation of the cracks. You're right that it's kind of confusing that there's extension happening That's how we'll finish. Forgot my coin purse today, Patrick. This is how I've taught it for years, or a few years, since I read uh, Mike Eddy's paper in 2016. And I might, I might change the way I teach it now, but... Um, Leslie's saying, if you add Silesia, why would you have pulling of the crust at all? That's what you're asking, right? And I tried to stress twice now in two different classes that the orientation of the cracks uh, as North America crosses the Yellowstone mantle plume is northeast, southwest. And these are tensional cracks. So each of these cracks is opening up and the Tillamook lavas of the Tillamook episode are coming to the surface. I'll bring my coin purse on Tuesday, I think. I meant to do it today, but if you know a coin purse and you haven't seen me do it before, to open a coin purse back in the day when we used coins and cash, you can picture a coin purse. You squeeze, you pinch the coin purse from two sides and it opens like a drawbridge in the opposite two directions. Compression, extension with a coin purse. And so if our compression directions are, north, are coming in from the northeast and the southwest, then we're going to have extension to the northwest and the southeast. Now, I've got to say that as soon as I'm in the middle of this, this conversation with you, what I've always talked about is Tianaway formation feeder dikes, just like I described. But I'm realizing as I'm talking to you right now, 
The feeder dikes in the Tianue Formation are way the hell up here. I don't. And these Tillamook feeder dikes are not from accretion. They start 42. So now I'm really getting to what I think maybe your question is. Are, are we getting, ex we have extension for sure in this orientation, but is, do you extend just when a mantle plume is beneath you? That's really what we're talking about here. These cracks and these extensional fissures, these extensional cracks, are in response to the mantle plume beneath Celestia that has already been accreted. And that's a different story than what I've talked about before up here. I need to rethink. Maybe my whole career has been a lie. A toast to you. You rock. Here's to your health in this season of, which month is this? What the hell are we doing? Are we still at this? Are we still locked down? Seriously? Here's to your health. I appreciate you joining us today. We still have more than 700. I'll look at those statistics that some of you reported. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to stop the live Q&A or whatever. I'm just curious how many we lose um, between the lecture itself and the lag time before we start doing some live Q&A. But generally, we've had this format for, I guess, more than a year now, so we'll continue with it. Hope you enjoy your weekend, everybody. Look for a field video that's nice and short called Cashmere Overlook, probably posted on Saturday. And maybe I'll film Andrew tomorrow, and I'll, I don't know, maybe I'll post that this weekend as well. Um, but maybe not. All right. I'm going to go talk to Tim. He's still in the room, if you can believe it. So thank you. I love you. And goodbye. See you next Tuesday for our next live stream session, 1 p.m. Pacific time. Jim? Jim? Over there. <laughs> oil, oil, 1939 reference. <laughs>